So this is chapters 9 and 10, polyprotic acids and bases, and polyprotic titrations. Real quick, polyprotic acids and bases, what are they? Polyprotic acids can donate more than one proton, and polyprotic bases can accept more than one proton. So, why do they matter? Most amino acids are diprotic, which, which means that they have two protons to give. They contain acidic and basic substituents, and the non-ionized form of the amino acid rearranges spontaneously into a zwitter ion, which has both positive and negative sites, as you can see from the scheme down here. This is the zwitter ion. So, uh, one major idea in this chapter is determining the major species in a solution. Polyprotic acids and bases can undergo multiple protonations and deprotonations. At equilibrium, multiple forms of the acid and base are present. So, for example, a solution of phosphoric acid contains phosphoric acid, um, as well as these other forms. The major species in the solution depends on the conditions. So, for example, the pH and the pKa values of the acid or base. Um, and there are many Henderson, as many Henderson-Hasselbeck equations as there are protonations or deprotonations in the solution. Um, and this figure down here just represents how to convert from Ka to Kb2, and so on. So, the major species of a diprotic solution. Diprotic solutions have two pKa values. At pKa1, the concentration of H2A is equal to the concentration of HA-, and for pKa2, the concentration of HA- is equal to the concentration of A2-. So to, to determine the major species, we're going to use a ladder diagram, such as this one right here. We're going to take our pH and compare it to the pK values. So if the, P, if the pH is less than the pK1, the major species is H2A. So if your pH falls on this range right here, which is less than pK1, then H2A is your major species. If the pH is between pK1 and pK2, right here, then your major species is HA minus, which is this right here. So you're just going to take your pH, determine where it lies in the ladder diagram, and that is your major species. So same thing for triprotic solutions. The ladder diagram is just a little bit bigger. Um, you're going to take your pH, determine where it lies in the ladder diagram, and that's your major species. Um, also to determine your second most dominant species, you're going to determine where the pH falls in that range. So it's the same thing, it's just more specific. So, say your pH lies in this range, somewhere in this range right here. If it's closer to pK2, then H2A- minus is your second most dominant species. So, these are just some diprotic fractions of species in solution. Um, F stands for the formal concentration, which is this right here. That's how you calculate formal concentration. Um, and as you can see, for each of these three... Um, the denominator is the same, and it's the formal concentration each time. Um, and the same thing for polyprotic fraction of species, just a little bit more complicated. D is the formal concentration, and this is how you calculate D. Um, so now diprotic buffers. Um, as we said earlier, there are as many Henderson-Hasselbeck equations as there are pKa values. So if there's two pKa values, these are your two Henderson-Hasselbeck equations. Um, and we're going to use whichever equation is more convenient based on the information that's given. So if you're given the concentration of HA- minus and H2A, you're going to use pK1, and you're going to use this Henderson-Hasselbeck equation right here. So an example buffer problem. How many mils of 0.8 molar KOH should be added to 3.38 grams of oxalic acid to give a pH of 4.4 when diluted to 500 mils? We're given pK1, pKa2, and oxalic acid formula weight. So just looking at what we're given, since the desired pH is above pKa2, 4.4 is above 4.26, we use pKa2 in the Henderson-Hasselbeck equations. Um, we also know that there must be more OX2- minus than OHx- minus because at pKa2, OX2- minus and OHx- minus are present in a one-to-one -one ratio. And since the pH is higher, that means that there's more of this. Uh, based on what we're given, this also indicates that we will use the second equation below. These two equations represent what is um, happening in the solution. And we know that we use this equation right here, based on what we're given. So the third step is to set up an ice table with that given equation. So we're going to convert grams to moles. Um, and that's our starting amount of HOX minus. We have an unknown starting amount of OH minus, 
and 0 OX 2 minus. So to find OH minus, we're going to subtract X from the HOX minus concentration that leaves us with 0 OH minus and X amount of OX 2 minus. So we continue from that. We use the equation from the ice table and the Henderson Hasselbeck to solve for X. So we're going to plug in. This is what we're going to get. Plug and chug. And you get X equals 0 0.2166 moles. And so we're going to use that molar quantity to convert to a volume given the original concentration of KO, KOH, which is the 0 0.8. So we're going to multiply that by 1 over 0.8 moles of KOH. These moles, these moles will cancel. It'll leave you with a volume. And that'll be 27.05 mils of KOH. However, that is not our final answer. Since our starting amount is 0 0.03754 moles, um, it's not just HOX minus in solution. It's also H2OX. So we need to determine how much OH minus will react with that. So we take the volume of the 0 0.8 moles KOH needed to react with 0 0.03754 moles, as I said. So we take, the, we take the molar quantity, same thing we did up here, multiply it by 1 liter over 0 0.8 moles. These moles will cancel, give us a volume, and that volume is 46.93 mils. And then to get our final answer, we add up the 46.93 we got right here, plus the 27.05 we got right here, and our final answer is 73.98 mils. So now calculating pH and solution compositions for diprotic solutions. This is for a solution of H2A. We're going to treat the H2A as a monoprotic acid with Ka equals K1 to find H plus, HA minus, and H2A. So this is our equation. We're going to set up our equation using the equilibrium expression, which is K1. So we have x squared which is H plus times HA minus, divided by F minus X, which is H2A equals K1. Um, and then we're going to use the K2 equilibrium to solve for A2 minus. So we can see here, A2 minus is equal to K2 times HA minus divided by H plus. But since H plus is equal to the HA, as you can see, they're both X, those will cancel. And A, A2 minus is equal to K2. Now for a solution of HA minus, we use the approximation that HA minus is about equal to the formal concentration, and we find the pH with the equation given right here, just plug and chug, and then we're going to use that hydrogen concentration from step one and the assumption we made to solve for H2A and A minus using K1 and K2. So these are the equations we're going to use right here. Now for a solution of A2 minus, we treat A2 minus as monobasic with KB1 equals with KB equals KB1, and KB1 is equal to KW over KA, using this box right here. And we're going to use that to find A2 minus, HA minus, and HA or H plus. So same thing as you did earlier, H X, X squared over F minus X equals KB1, which is equal to KW over KA2, using this again. And then to get the H plus, we do KW over OH minus. And then to get the A2 minus, comes from right here, we do the formal concentration minus X. And that's all demonstrated in this ice table right here. Now to solve for the H2A, we're going to use K1. So we take HA minus times H plus divided by KA1. Um, and since H plus is kw over oh minus we plug that in instead of instead of the h plus uh, the concentration of oh minus is the same as the concentration of ha as you can see right here they're both x those cancel and so we get kw i'm sorry we're just left with uh, kb2 um, and these are just the equilibrium expressions uh, for a polyprotic system um, these are also important because it demonstrates how to go from um, KB1, or how to, how to get KB1, KB2, and KB3 using your Ka values that you're given. Now for polyprotic systems, uh, we treat H3A as monoprotic weak acid with Ka equals K1. H2A is treated as an intermediate form of a diprotic acid. 
Um, we use this equation right here to get H+. Plus. H2A is also treated as the intermediate form. Um, we use a very similar equation, just slightly modified, as you can see right here, a little bit in the numerator as well. And then we treat A3- minus as monobasic with KB equals KB1, and KB1 is equal to KW over KA3. So just a, a couple of definitions real quick. Isoionic pH, this is the pH of the pure neutral polyprotic acid. To find that pH, we use this equation right here that we've seen before. Um, and then the isoelectric pH, this is the pH at which the average charge of the polyprotic acid is zero. And to get that pH, we use this equation right here. So now for titrations. So how do you determine the equivalence volume? Um, so first, one of the options we could do is the raw data, obviously. So we take the raw data, construct the titration curve, which we've all seen before, and then we take the steepest slope of that titration curve. This could be a little bit tricky because it's kind of hard to determine that slope. Um, our next option is to take the first derivative of that graph, which will give us a maximum, and that maximum corresponds to the steepest slope on the raw data, so that'll make it a little bit easier to determine what that steepest slope is. And then to make that even easier, if that's not clear enough, we can take the second derivative. And on that second derivative, the steepest slope of that, um, of that graph will intersect the x-axis at zero. And that will be the equivalence volume. Um, and while those, those uh, methods work, the grand plot is the most effective and the most accurate. Um, so the titration data is the least accurate near the endpoint, and this is because of minimal buffering and the pH electro response is sluggish. So this causes a problem when we're using the derivative methods that we just mentioned. So we use the data leading up to the endpoint to determine the endpoint, so that's 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 of the equivalence volume. And so because grand, points, grand plots eliminate the least accurate data, they are the most accurate. So now indicators. Indicators are actually weak acids and bases themselves. We use a very small amount of the indicator so that we do not titrate the indicator. Choosing an indicator, uh, we choose an indicator that changes color near the pH of the endpoint. The pKa of the indicator um, must be very close to the pH of the endpoint. So for example, um, a titration has an endpoint va pH value of 8.3. We use Cresol Red as an indicator because it has a pK value of 8.0, which is very close to 8.3. Um, and so for diprotic and polyprotic titrations, uh, we use indicators with multiple transitions. And just a general rule of thumb, color change usually occurs uh, within, P within a pKa of plus minus one pH unit, which is demonstrated in this table right here. As you can see, the colors change when the pH unit varies by one. So now for titrations of strong base with strong acid, these are pretty straightforward. Before the equivalence volume, the pH is determined by the excess of OH minus in a solution. At the equivalence volume, the pH or the amount of H plus is equal to the amount of OH minus. So the pH is determined by the association of water. That means the pH will be seven, assuming pure water. But the pH of pure water is or the pH of water is almost never seven. So you have to be careful with that. And then after the equivalence volume, the pH is determined by the excess H+. So, like I said, it's pretty straightforward. Now for finding the pH of the titration of a weak acid with a strong base. So, before any base is added, that's right here on the graph, we find the pH for a pure weak acid, H2A, and we use an ice table. Um, so between 0 and the first equivalence volume, so it's between here and here, any one of these points, um, you can see we're in a buffer region, so that means we can use the Henderson-Hasselbeck with pKa1. Um, when we finally reach the equivalence volume, the first equivalence volume, uh, we find the pH of the pure intermediate HA, as you can see right here. And we found the, P we found the pH of the pure intermediate of HA in the previous slides. Um, and so when we're between the first equivalence volume and the second equivalence volume, so between here and here, you can see we're in a buffer region again. So we're going to use the Henderson-Hasselbeck, except this time we're going to use pKa2. And finally, when we reach the second equivalence volume, this right here, 
we're going to find the pH for pure A2 minus. Again, we did that in the previous slides. Um, after that second equivalence volume, we're going to find the pH of the excess OH minus. Um, and just one more shortcut right here. Um, at half of the first equivalence volume or half of the second equivalence volume, the pH is equal to pK1, pKa1 or pKa2 respectively, and that's just a little bit of a shortcut that can help you out. Um, and just to note, uh, the process is pretty much the same for a titration of a strong base with a weak acid, just the curve. Um, just looks a little bit different. Um, the pH, the starting pH will be higher and it will decrease over time as acid is added. Um, so the leveling effect, this is the idea that, um, a pretty interesting idea, uh, the strongest acid or base in water um, are H3O plus and OH minus respectively. Because of this, all strong acids and bases seem equally strong in water. Um, however, this is not true in other solvents. So this idea is very useful when carrying out titrations with endpoints that are not very recognizable. So uh, some solutions need a stronger acid or a stronger base than H3O plus or OH minus to give a larger equilibrium constant. And as a result, this gives a more recognizable endpoint. And this can be accomplished by using a different solvent, which allows for a stronger acid or base. And real quick, just some things to note. Um, standardized base solutions. Uh, bases contain absorbed water and carbonate. Uh, we standardize them to determine their concentration before using them for a titration. Um, what makes a good primary standard? Uh, that's something that's very pure and extremely stable. Uh, also, do not leave highly basic solutions in glass, for example, a burette, because OH- etches glass, and we do not want that. So for that reason, we store basic solutions in plastic bottles. And lastly, we protect basic solutions from the atmosphere because they can absorb CO2 and increase acidity. So that's it. Have a good one. Thanks for listening.